See, now I feel bad. I've been doing this for 31 years, and if I only have 13 things to say, that doesn't say much for a long career in UX. Um, but let me give a little bit more background about me. Um, I started in UX before it was called UX. Um, back in 1991 was my first job out of grad school. My academic background is research. I have a, a doctorate in cognitive psychology, which means I know something about experimental methods and statistics and learning and memory and cognition and sensation and perception, all of which doesn't sound like it's related to UX, but give me a couple of slides and I'll show you how. Um, I am currently the direct, uh, senior director of UX and product management at a company called NVIDIA Technologies, which is uh, a company in Princeton, New Jersey, and we support television advertising, uh, which I promise you does not come up in this presentation, but I'm happy to tell you about that afterwards. Um, I also know that I probably won't be able to answer every question um, unless there are no questions in which case I will have answered every question. But you can always reach me. I'm happy to respond to email if you want to do that. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. And part of what I wanted to talk about today is that it is possible to both do this for a career because for a long time, this is all I have ever done. I have never had a job that was not UX. Uh, I have worked in both large in-house uh, UX groups, large companies, as well as small design agencies. I have been an individual contributor. I have been a hiring manager, so there isn't much that I haven't done yet. Um, but you can do all of that and have a life. This is what I do for fun. That's me. Um, so, you know, feel free. Spend your company's insurance policy money. Um, you, it, fine. Okay, um, one more introduction. This is one of our cats. This is Louie, um, and I decided to lo use Louie as our QR code cat because throughout my talk, I will have the occasional QR code, um, and they link out to papers or presentations, things that I think are useful and relevant to what I happen to be talking about at the moment. If you want to test it, this just goes to my LinkedIn profile, but it should work. Okay. Um, so. I promised 13 things, let's start at the beginning. And I think it's important, especially as we as a profession have moved further and further away from our roots, to describe where UX came from. So to do that, you need to go back to the 1900s. And our earliest professional ancestors were these people called efficiency experts. And they were concerned with optimizing factory assembly lines. And the field at the time was known as scientific management. Fast forward 40 years, and the technology changes. Now we're talking about big pieces of hardware, mining machinery interfaces, nuclear power plants, um, large commercial aircraft, military equipment. And because of that, there needed to be a shift in the specialty of the people. And the people who took over for the for the folks in the 1900s were the industrial engineers. And the field becomes known as ergonomics. And in fact, if you wanted a job in ergonomics, you needed a degree in, in industrial engineering. And not to say that I'm this old, but my very first course in UX, which wasn't called UX, was a course in ergonomics in the industrial engineering program. Fast forward some years from there, and the technology shifts again. Now, instead of big pieces of hardware, now we're looking at this new weird little thing called software, which the industrial engineers couldn't contribute to. And in fact, the people who were designing software were the developers. And there was no problem with that. Nobody had a problem with that. Developers knew software, so they figured out what it needed to do. They knew what it was going to look like, and they built it. Nice, easy, tidy. What was necessary was for a professional to come in who could figure out why nobody could use the software. And what was needed was somebody who knew experimental design, statistics, learning, memory, cognition, sensation, and perception to do usability testing. And that was people like me. 
So we came in in the 60s. I didn't come in until 1991 when it was still kind of human factors. And in fact, human factors as a name, you may remember or may have heard human factors engineering because the org charts of the day were used to the industrial engineers and needed some place to put people like me. Psychologists, we don't know where to put you, but we'll call you a human factors engineer, and then you fit in the org chart. And in fact, I was introduced once, honest to God, as this is our new HEFE, because they tried to make an acronym out of HFE. It was embarrassing, it didn't stick. Once we got this job where we were doing usability testing, the most obvious thing was if only you invited us into the design process earlier, we could have prevented you from making these mistakes which we're showing you exist now. And we made that argument in the 70s and in the 80s. And then finally by like the 90s-ish, somebody said, yeah, all right, you know, Come on in, we'll give you a seat at the table. You can be part of the design early on so we don't continue spending money rebuilding things that we've already coded. To which people like me said, yay, and then quickly realized that people like me are not designers, right? I am a researcher, analytical guy by trade. I'm not bad at some design stuff, but a true designer is a world different than me. And now what we're talking about is putting design at the front of the process, which opened it up to everybody in the room. That's how you became user experience professionals, because now we weren't worried about the human factor anymore. We were worried about the larger experience. But because we have this tradition of science, we have usability standards, we have guidelines, we have best practices, some of those were related to the technology of the day, and some of those have been updated off and on over time. But some of those were relevant to the people who use software. And those have not changed because people haven't changed. And an example of that is readability, right? In order to be readable from a certain standard distance, 500 millimeters from your screen, a character needs to be at least 2.33 millimeters tall. That's what the human visual system can handle. If you move further away, it needs to be taller. If you have a higher resolution, you need more pixels to create that 2.33 millimeter character. And you can say today, well, programmatically, we let the software deal with it. It knows what machine it's being displayed on, so it will choose a font that's readable. But there are still times when you have to do this manually. Think enterprise software, think, um, large dashboards, displays in rooms. You can't just have a little character. You need to understand how people are going to be viewing it, what their purpose in viewing it. It could be how quickly they're passing it. So there needs to be an understanding of the rules behind why we do the designing that we do. And being a good UX person, requires not only that you know the rules, but know when and how to apply them. If you ignore them, you run the risk of stuff like this, which could just easily be a picture of my mother looking at her phone trying to read the app like from the doctor's office. Telling you to follow the rules only works if you know what the rules are. In the US, we have digital.gov. That is our current government website for all things digital which means that it is very difficult to find any specific thing on digital.gov. The previous website, usability.gov, I mean, you can see it in the names how the field has progressed, um, was much more focused on usability issues, guidelines, standards, that sort of stuff, and is much easier to, to find something of relevance. It's no longer being updated, but it is still live, so you can still go there. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm coming to Belgium. I'll be in the European Union. There must be some equivalent in the European Union. Maybe it's my ability to search, um, but I couldn't find it. So I apologize. If somebody says, oh no, you know, that website is right there. Cool, I'll, I'll update my slide. What I could find was this PDF called the Eurostat Usability Guidelines, which is a 100-page document 
honest to God, it's just a, it's a document. It's like somebody turned in a term paper hoping to like get their master's degree. It has a lot of useful stuff in there. It is almost completely unusable. And the irony is not lost on me here. OK. Um, so moving on now. We do have a process. And I am a proponent of our design process. And should you happen to be perusing LinkedIn, because I see it surfaces every once in a while, there'll be a couple of posts that say, oh, the design process is broken. It's not broken. And I'll tell you why. This is the design process. You may know this from iterative versions, circular versions. This one just happened to, to work out for me today. We have people with certain specialties. We have researchers. We have designers. Testing is usually a secondary function for researchers. Um, and we have the development team. And it is completely collaborative. And I'm kind of giving you an ideal view. right? And the colors beneath, these are not simply for show. These represent the relative contributions of the purple researchers, the blue designers, and the green UI folks. And in each stage, there are deliverables. right? You have to produce something which serves some purpose to move the design process forward. So researchers working with designers and developers might be primarily responsible for strategy documents, requirements. right? There's all sorts of possible um, deliverables, artifacts here. The designers are going to be primarily responsible for concept visualization, interaction design, maybe wireframes. Uh, wireframes are becoming almost a passe concept now with Figma. Um, testing, notice, and development. And even when we get to development, while actually this is a, a little poor layout here, green should be above the blue, um, but there even is still some role for research during the development process itself. It doesn't matter how creative or insightful you are. Complex projects, oh, and I should give you an aside, my work throughout my entire career has been almost exclusively focused on complex business software, enterprise software. Not, not really websites, although back in the day when websites kind of all they were. Um, so my focus tends to be in a fairly specific area. So for me, certainly, it doesn't matter how good you are at your particular job. If you don't follow the process, what you get at the far end may not work as well as you would like. And this is not a new process. Human beings have been following a design process for 10,000 years, ever since the first person said, you know what would make getting dinner better? A sharp rock at the end of a stick. That would make life easier, right? Because they did a little research. They maybe did a little design. Maybe they did a little testing. This rock doesn't work so well. The flint one, yeah, that's a sharp point. It keeps it, you know, poke, poke, poke. Cool, you know, lunch. Um, and if you hear somebody say, well, this process is broken, what I would argue is they were either never taught design as a process, they didn't learn design as a process, or they're not following design as a process. Because this works perfectly fine. This is not design. This is a development process. It is, what, what's Agile now, like 20 years old, something like that? And it took the place of the previous development process, which was waterfall. Something will take the place of Agile. Bet your next paycheck. Things that get replaced quickly by other things, they're fads. right? This is a, a development fad. Sorry. Just, just an opinion. I'm apologizing to generic developers in the room. Um, and I won't even get into, although we can do it later over drinks, um, why it appears to be necessary for a, a well-established design process to somehow shoehorn itself into a 20-year-old development process. But that's a whole separate issue. OK, moving on. I hear oftentimes people asking about portfolios. Right? What should I have in my portfolio? Which is an entirely reasonable request. It is your introduction to a hiring manager you hope will give you lots of money. Right? So what should I have in there? Should I have my mobile designs? Should I show iconography? 
what if I'm a researcher and I don't have a lot of cool stuff to show, right? I just have research methods and results and things. Um, most important is that you view your portfolio as a lens through which to tell people like me that you understand that. All the stuff that you're putting in there, if you're a researcher, tell me that you can identify the best research method for a particular problem. Show me that you can analyze the data and create alternative um, suggestions for what this application should do, ideally with some sketches. And if you're a designer, show me that you can take a particular requirement and create multiple designs that meet that need and tell me the pros and cons for each of those designs. Ultimately, your portfolio should not just show me what you've done, but explain to me why you've done it. And that's the mistake I see people making all the time. They think it's a place to put their pretty pictures and show me you know, what a great aesthetic I have. Good, but why? Remember those deliverables in the process. Um, there are other people involved in the work that we do that, that have some say in the overarching project that are waiting for you to finish your work so that they can start theirs. And UX professionals tend to be terrible at estimating how much time it's going to take them to do those things. And I guarantee you, if you can't tell me when I can start, I'm going to tell you how long you have. You don't know how long it's going to take? Yeah, well, now it's taking you two weeks. So, you know, best of luck. My suggestion is, honest to God, take out Excel, create a spreadsheet, three columns. First column are all of the tasks that you might be performing for a particular project. Right? See your work through the lens of the typical things we do. And then a column for estimated and a column for actual. And those are for the hours that you think it's going to take. Go through each one at the beginning of the project. How many hours will it take me to do these things? 40, 80, 120? Doesn't matter. I guarantee you, you will be way off. Once you're working, keep track of the hours. And when you finish a particular line in your spreadsheet, Go back and write down the number of hours. Don't be too disappointed if they are wildly different. Over time, doing this will force you to more accurately estimate your work because you'll have some basis on which to put that estimate. And eventually, not only will you figure out um, how to estimate for a particular project, but since projects differ, you'll be able to figure out how to estimate regardless of the project. Should we worry about that? No. OK. <laughs> cool. I also get asked a lot, should I work in an agency or should I work in-house? Um, and this one is a little bit trickier because, like a lot of things, it kind of depends. If you work for an agency, you get a wide amount of experience to different projects, to different customers, to different user types, to different problems all compressed in a very short period of time. There are also a large number of individuals who are designers like you, whether you're a researcher or a designer specifically, or a developer, um, who are there as a support network to help you learn your, your craft, to help you hone your skills, which you will, by necessity, have to do. On the flip side, if you work in-house, you tend to have a much longer term view. You have um, a smaller number of problems and user types because typically companies focus on things. Um, you may be using a particular component library or libraries so that that world is much less diverse. But you're there for the long term. If you're an agency, you tend to do your thing and you're out, right? You're on to the next project. When will the thing you design get built? You don't know. Maybe it'll never get built. Maybe it'll get built in two years, in five years. You are long gone. You won't see it. If you work in-house, not only will you get to see your work come to fruition, but you'll be able to go out and talk to the people who use it, which is very satisfying. Also, 
the timing is not so compressed. So whereas at an agency, somebody might expect you to work until whenever a thing is done, because at 9 a.m. you have a meeting to, to show some deliverables, in-house, it tends to be much more flexible. You probably get to go home for dinner. I'm not going to leave it at that. I do have a recommendation. If you are junior or mid-level, work at an agency. You will learn more in a shorter period of time, and the longer you can stick it out, the sharper you will become. Not everybody sticks around for their career at an agency. It's hard work. Most people will bop in between one and the other. They'll get tired of one, they'll go back. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that we don't work alone. The design process isn't a solo effort. There are other people who have stakes in what we do. And I'm not just talking about if you're a designer, the research partner you have, or the UI developer. But other folks out there who, who care about what we're doing because it impacts them. I want to talk about two of these people. The first are our development colleagues. You make their lives difficult. Accept this, right? You are designing the best thing that you can. You're not giving much thought about how problematic it is to build. It's the perfect solution. Your designs don't always make sense to them, and your designs are definitely more complicated than they would build for themselves. Remember, developers used to be designers too, back before, you know, some of you were born. <laughs> um, so what's necessary is for you to be able to explain why your more difficult to code design is better than their easier to code design. And simply saying, well, I'm the UX person, or, oh, mine makes the user's job easier, is a terrible answer. Answers can never be subjective. They always have to be objective. Show me why. Because if I think mine is better and you think yours is better, I'm going to go with mine because mine is easier. The second group are clients and bosses. These are the people who will pester you until you die with inane questions like, why did you use red here and not blue? Why did you choose this font and not that font? Why did you put the submit button on the left? And the cancel button on the right, why didn't you put the cancel button on the left and the submit button on the right? Like the developer answer, you need to be able to explain to them why. They may disagree with your solution, but they should both understand and accept your logic, your reasoning that got you to that point. Right? Let me ask just a thought question. Imagine you're designing a form. It has one question on it. <clears throat> Are UX designers fun people? Yes, no. You can imagine whatever answer you'd want. But at the end, you have to have a cancel button and a submit button. Right? In your mind's eye, picture this. Hands up for the submit button on the right. Submit button on the left. If I withheld your next paycheck until you could give me a logical rationale for that decision, could you do it? Yes. Yeah, I, I could do it, and I have an answer, right? And mine is the button, submit button, always goes on the right in Western cultures because we are moving the process forward. And to, from left to right indicates forwardness. Now, the reason that there is any sort of religious argument behind this thing is because Microsoft used to put the submit button on the left. Apple came along and put the submit button on the right. Take your pick, right? If one is as good as the other, then either you have to do it randomly or you need some rationale, right? You can disagree with my choice to put it on the right, but you should at least understand my rationale for that decision. And if you don't have a rationale for putting it on the left, I win. OK. I wrote an article some years back called The One Rule of UX Consulting. And in it, I argue, um, not without some argument itself, that as the professional, right, you were hired as the expert, that it's your responsibility to be able to explain your rationale 
to your audience in such a way that they understand it. I had a conversation after I wrote this article with a woman who worked for me, and she said, yeah, but they just don't get it. I was like, did you not read my article? If your audience doesn't understand it, it is not their fault for not understanding it. It's your fault for not providing them with something that they can understand. We are supposed to be user experience. If we can't explain what we're doing to a person, that suggests a problem. Okay, um, so let's say you've gotten all of that right out of the way, you're the king of classroom knowledge, and now it's time to go out in the field because somebody says, we're gonna go out and do some, some user research. What should you be looking for? You should be looking for three things. Initially, the lowest bar of user experience. Is this thing usable? Right? This is strictly application focused. I don't need a user there to know if a thing is usable. Remember, we have usability standards, guidelines, best practices. We have heuristic evaluations, all of which are designed to take advantage of what we know about people so that I don't need a person sitting in front of the machine to know if the font is too small to read. I don't need a person sitting in front of the machine to know if the contrast ratio is high enough for me to tell foreground from background. And I don't need a person sitting in front of the machine to know if my form labels are aligned correctly. Right? We know how people behave in these situations. I don't need that, again, to know that these things are yet still true. This stuff you should do in your sleep. Right? You should look at a screen and go, yep, these are the problems. I don't have to go and do any research. I know it, right? I do this often enough. Once you can do that quickly, then that frees up attention for you to move to the next higher bar, the thing that we're typically hired to do, and that is, is the thing useful? Right? There's a difference between usable and useful. Usefulness is interaction focused. This is where we're concerned about the person application as a pair, right? I only know usefulness if I know what they're trying to achieve and whether or not they can achieve it. This is what we get hired to do, right? We, we go out and we figure out what users need. We figure out what users say they want, also two different things. And we fold that in together with the constraints from the business and maybe the constraints from the hardware and software platform that we're ultimately using. You know, so that may define some of the stuff we can and can't do. If you can do this well, everybody goes home happy. You get to go home happy, users are happy, your boss is happy, the client is happy, and everybody thinks, great, right? This is the pinnacle of user experience work. It is both usable and useful. Woohoo! I tell you, it is not all we can do. Just like in the previous one where once I free up attention, I can focus on this, this starts to become automatic too. Once you free up enough attention from this, then you can start asking yourself, is it innovative? And for this, you need to consider the person and the application pair within the larger information ecosystem within which they exist. And by information ecosystem, I mean other devices, other people, other information and systems, other documentation, um, even the, the physical environment itself, right? We tend to think of the person sitting in front of the machine working on a particular piece of software as the only things that exist in the world, like they're a vacuum. We can treat them separately from everything else. And Sometimes we can, and we can, we can create incremental improvement by just focusing on the pair. If you can free up enough attention to see how the rest of their environment interacts with them, then we move beyond incremental and we, we move into the, the territory of insight. Right? When you start hearing clients say, oh, I never thought of doing it like that before, then you've discovered something new. And, and this is where our job gets both profoundly interesting and profoundly exciting. 
because no one thought of doing it like that before. One caveat here, people do not hire us for this. If you're out there to make something more useful and you're walking around looking at the people in the building and you know what other machines you got going on here, you're using your phone for this, clients tend to look at that as stuff that they shouldn't have to pay for, right? Just focus on this, this is what I'm giving you money for. It, do it anyway, right? Hide it if you have to, make believe you're going to lunch, walk around, pretend it's the bathroom. This is where we earn our money as professionals. Okay, back to something specific. Businesses love dashboards. Dashboards are very useful, and dashboards are almost always designed very, very poorly. I came across this dashboard um, not too long ago at one of our customers. Um, and dashboards like this contain a lot of data, right? There's a lot of data here, but there's not a lot of information. And the difference is, Dashboards that have a lot of data require the user to impose meaning on them, to make sense, to be actionable, right? If I'm looking at this, I have to know in my head, well, if the top one is red and the middle one is green and that row right next to it, they're all in white, that means, ah, cool, everything's okay, right? But if, you know, the top left is red and that you know, right hand one, 150 milliseconds, let's say that one is red. That means I have to take my fire extinguisher and run into the server room to put out, you know, bay 37 because it's on fire. I have to impose meaning to, to see what this is telling me. The person who created this dashboard, and I know why they did it, because they weren't given any insight into the questions users were asking. So I can't really fault them, right? They were just told, show me all the data, and they show them all the data. Um, but this doesn't care about the questions users are trying to ask. It doesn't care about the environment within which those answers have meaning. Or the context, it, it simply prevents data. Good dashboards present information because information is immediately actionable. It answers the questions that users have so that they don't have to go, wait, if this is moving in that way and that's moving this way, what does this all mean? They are immediately actionable because they tell a story. This isn't going to mean much to you, but to someone who's monitoring the hardware and software between different data elements in an advertising backend system, this is telling them not only what's happening at a specific time, but it allows them to go back or forwards in time to both see the cause of an event and see where that event is likely to happen in the future should they not take action. Okay. I had you raise your hands once before. I'm going to ask you to do it three more times. That's it, I swear. I'm going to put three things on the board one at a time. I need you to raise your hand if you believe they are true. Don't leave me hanging by here myself up here. The audience on camera can't see, but they'll see my face when I go, uh huh. So, fail early, fail often. True statement. False. <laughs> Here's why. First, actually, I'll give you two reasons. First, you're a UX person. You're being hired for a job. Somebody's coming in to give your company a lot of money for your hourly services. And you tell them, yeah, well, we're going to fail a lot in the beginning, though, but we're still going to charge you. Why would somebody pay for that? We have a, a research-based design process. If you don't understand what your users need, you haven't done the research process. By the time your initial design is done, and let's say you start doing some usability testing, I guarantee you if you've done the research correctly, you are 80% correct. There is no failing early or failing often. We don't fail. The design process, I hate to say, is designed to keep us from failing. The 80% that you have that you're only missing 20% of when you go out and do testing, that's just fine-tuning at the end. 
you should be, by definition, that close to being perfect. Okay, that was a bit of a letdown. See you put the second one. Good designers code. True? Oh, it's just the coders. <laughs> um, also false. Um, if you are responsible for coding the thing you design, you will only design within the limitations of your ability to code, right? Why would you design a thing that you can't build if you're responsible for building it? No one will. And I'll say it again. If you're responsible for coding your design, you will only design within your limitations of your ability to code. Allow the developers to be experts at development I'm not saying don't understand development, don't appreciate development, don't know that this sort of a design or this sort of an interaction, this is gonna be really difficult to do because of the number of calls it makes to the backend systems, right? All of that is fine, right? Maybe you modify your design to minimize the number of calls, to, to increase response time, all cool. But the design should be the best design that you can do and allow the development team to do what they do best. Okay, last one. UX requires empathy. True statement. False statement. I know, I, I, it was a bad trick. I should have just said they're all gonna be the same. Um, but this one, I feel strongly enough about that I'm giving it its own number 11. Not only is this a false statement, but I would argue that it is detrimental to the profession of user experience as a whole. And I will try and explain. And I guarantee you there'll be questions after my explanation. Two beers in, you can have whatever answers you want from me. <laughs> Whoop. There we go. Um, first off, empathy is not an objective research method. If you assume empathy is required for design, it means that you are designing best based on what you think users need, right? That's not research. If you think empathy is required for design, it means that if I have two designers creating a solution for the same problem, that they are both likely to create something different from one another. If you think that empathy is required for design, it means that you have to accept the logical conclusion that you will be better at designing for some people than for other people because nobody is per perfectly empathetic toward all users. We tend to think of design as being for people like us, right? It's a website. It's this, it's that, right? I, I buy shoes so I can figure out what's problematic for me if I'm online buying shoes. But if your user is a network engineer, an Air Force pilot, um, a heart surgeon, for which I have designed software, you can't base your design on empathy. You can't empathize with those specialties. You might be able to empathize with how difficult it is to commute to work, but Kind of, it kind of stops there. So I'm more than happy to talk about this later. I hope that it causes people to go, huh? Okay, this has been a lot and I haven't even been keeping track of time and I'm sure I'm over my 30 minutes. Um, but take a breath for a moment. Um, being a UX pro can be a lot. It is not something that you can just jump in and be great at. What I want you to think about here is when you're busy, right, when you're doing work, interesting thoughts will come to you. Oh, this interaction model, this is, this is kind of weird, but it worked well here. Um, this bit of research, this was interesting. I should probably try and use this somewhere else. Keep a notepad. As these interesting ideas come up, write them down. It doesn't have to be a long essay, a couple of words, a sentence, just enough so that in six months' time, when the work goes from crazy, crazy to the space between projects, you can take out that notepad and find all those things you wrote and say, oh, this one, I still remember this one. This one is still an interesting idea. 
write about it. A few words, a few paragraphs, write a blog. Right? Think about what you're doing. And then go find one of your colleagues and ask them to talk to you about it. Right? Refine your ideas. Then present in public. Kudos to you guys for presenting in public today. Because presenting in public requires you to think on your feet, and it requires you to have thought deeply about a topic, both so important to becoming the best UX professional that you can become. Because people will challenge your designs, rightly so, because they don't have the same experience as you, and you need to be able to react and defend and help them understand why you've done what you've done. And then finally, for us, perfection does exist. Right? It is not simply this ideal to which we aspire. It is possible to have the perfect insight into a problem, the perfect design, the perfect interaction model that meets your user's needs so exactly it makes you want to weep. It will happen to you. And when it does, you will know it. Your users will know it. Your colleagues and your boss will know it. And like a disturbance in the force, I will know it. <laughs> so keep working, keep learning, keep honing your craft and asking questions. Because you in the room tonight, you are the future of UX, not me. And it's your job to move the field forwards. Thank you. Thank you so much for this really nice summary of all your insights you've gathered in the know, last. It's, it, it's a little sad though, right? 31 years and that's it, 45 <laughs> minutes. No, I love them. Some <laughs> of them. I really, I can find myself in them as well, as much as you can, especially design and code thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I always like, there was a long time where they said, um, no, 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 designers have to code. And I always kept saying, no, 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 we should have specialists. Uh, you, you just, it's, it's you an can't be brilliant in everything. And it's an economical decision, of course. Business is going to tell you you should do both because then they can hire one person instead of two. Don't fall for it. <laughs> become the expert in your field. Don't worry about the other fields. Let them become experts there. Completely agree. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Um, but I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the audience. Or they are just, ah, oh, voila, the first one. <laughs> Hard questions, we'll have to wait till sobriety passes. Yes. As a research expert, I was wondering, are a lot of strategies uh, also do research? And they think that the research that you do as a UX expert is different or is the same as what they do as a strategist. And sometimes they will also do the user research and do the interviews and write a strategic uh, approach for your project. And I was wondering if what your take is on this. Like, um, I, I would probably need to know how we define strategists. Um, because that sounds like a specific term in a context. Um, but in truth, if, if what you're doing is what I described research as doing, whether you call yourself a UX researcher or a strategist is, is irrelevant. Right? As long as you're doing the right stuff in the process, collaborating with the other people, then, you know, cool, do it. Um, it's, it's when there are people doing the right things, and I have seen this, where instead of all of that overlap in my picture, there are the right people doing the right things, but they're doing it by themselves. So I'm going to do my research. Here's all the stuff the software should do. And I chuck it over the wall, and I move off to my next project. There is not enough creativity in the world to bring that back together again. It requires collaboration. So as long as they're collaborating, right, you can call yourself a a strategist, that's fine. Um, I do see sometimes there being disconnects between what certain companies feel product owners should do. Um, and here's where like, there tries to be a coordination between a, a development process and a UX process. Um, I, I haven't seen that work 
well yet. Um, but maybe someone will prove me wrong. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, um, so, uh, unfortunately, we are one of those um, agile companies. <laughs> My company is an agile company. It, you can be an agile development company. Cool. Um, we're, we're an agile alcoholics. Uh, so, um, but what, what I what I just have a question, what I, what I do find very interesting is that yes, there is a design process which, um, which, which visualizes somewhat linearly, and what the Agile process does sort of allow for is to uh, implement learnings that have sort of, um, as Frank said, uncool the roots. Mm -hmm. That sort of when time goes by, you learn new stuff, and that can be sort of active lessons like, oh crap, didn't think of that, as well as passive lessons like nobody's clicking that one golden button we made. Yep. So it does allow for sort of implementing, whereas I feel that the, the, the more traditional process sort of feels very Groundhog Day type style. Ah, think of it this way. Um, in, in the two agile pictures, the correct one, which showed you know, the, the scooter and the motorcycle and the car you know, leading along for, for MVP and then you know, two, three, four, five. Um, in order to know what your ultimate goal is, you need to have done design called sprint zero, right? I need to know ultimately what I'm trying to build. Once I know that, then I can pull pieces out of that and say, okay, here's enough thing to provide um, usefulness to people as an MVP one. But I know how all the other pieces fit so that I can build this with that in mind. So I see design as complementing agile in that I don't build a thing, right? I don't build a bicycle knowing why I want a car. Because then it becomes throwaway. How do I make that deliverable somehow serve the greater purpose of the auto at the end of the cycle? Or series of cycles, I guess. Um, and, that's, and that's what design does. And yes, there's you know, big design up front. Ah, but you know, so what? If it's not impacting the development schedule, who cares what design does? As long as we get from it what we need to know what we have to build. And for companies that insist on thinking of design as part of Agile, and there are companies where you just can't convince them, then I think of it as a sprint zero, and my sprint zero may take two months. Doesn't matter, I'm gonna be done before you start sprint one. So we will have a plan for what happens at the end of sprint one, two, three, four, et cetera. And know that we are not building anything that's throwaway. You know, here's a piece of software and it's got two features in it. I know that people need it. I know already that they will use it and how. And I know how these features will fit in with all of the other features so that I don't build a door but not realize that it's not actually a house that goes around it but an igloo to use a bad analogy. Yeah, and, and some of this, I think, is a religious difference. But it's, it's super interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting. Very nice. Just to come back to something really trivial, and I'm gonna have myself as the developer in case I hadn't done that. I was gonna ask people who are the purple developers. Yeah, but that's me. <laughs> um, the one question form thing where you mentioned on which side you put the submit button and the cancel button. <laughs> me, me as a developer immediately thinks, why does there have to be a button? Ah, well, if there was one question, the only thing the button would allow you to do is to think about your answer before it automatically gets submitted. I assume that's where you were going. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's, that's a fine answer. And that's why developers are part of the design process. Because each expertise offers its own insight. Right? There may be things about what code can do today that I've never experienced. And if only I knew, oh, you could do that? Oh, then I would have changed all of this. Forget about these columns and pulling things into different orders. If like, we could just go click, click, cool. Right? You know, that, that just blew my mind. We'll do it this way. And that's why everybody has to be involved from the very beginning. When we go out and do research, it's not just me, it's me, the, the other researchers, the other designers, and the development leads. 
we go out together because we're looking at the same thing, but we're seeing things from our own perspective. And, and it's, it's exactly because of that reason that that happens. Very good answer. Oh. <laughs> no. oh, yes. A last question and then we round um, up and the rest will be for the beers. What's an accessibility problem you come across often in website and in mobile design? Oh, it is such a simple thing, and I've been fighting my company for it for five years now. There, and now I'm going to make somebody feel bad who watches this video. I hope they're not. I'm sorry. The, the style guide that my company uses is an old IBM style guide, and it insists on using the word click. Not everybody uses a mouse. Not everybody clicks. Everybody selects something. So I have been in documentation and on screens crossing out the word click and writing the word select, uh, honest to God, for five years now. And it is just starting to take root, I think because they're tired of hearing me complain about it. Because I have a rationale, right? Well, why not just say click? Because not everybody clicks. And they're like, oh. <laughs> But, but it's so simple, right? And it's just one of these passive things that if you were not a mouse user, you would be like, oh man, they, they're just always for the clicky people. They're not for me. <laughs> but it's just a simple wording change. It's, it doesn't even have to do with code or alt tags or you know anything like that. Um, and then if I had to choose a second one, it would be the ability to tab correctly through the fields on a screen. That should be automatic. Right. In fact, it should be so automatic that in this last project, I never even thought to define it. We have a, a long straight form where it's, you know, label field, label field, label field, label field. And the tabs were like, zzz, zzz, zzz. Oh, no. oh, come on, guys. <laughs> it, but I never even thought to ask about it because I made an assumption that, of course, out of everything, this would be done. Because developers love tabbing through things. They're like, done, there it is. You know, never a mouse <laughs> at all. So yeah, this little stuff that you would think, it's 2023. We don't have to worry about this anymore. You still have to worry about it. <laughs> That's the user testing you were talking about in the beginning. Oh my god, it didn't even come out with the user testing. It was one of the oh. developers who were like, should we do it this way? And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. Oh dear, oh dear. But that's part of having everybody on the team, right? It's, it's not just me deciding a thing and giving it to a development group who sits you know, somewhere between Edmonton and Stockholm and India, in my case. It's, it's all of us, we meet three times a week to talk about the designs that we've finished so that they can ask questions and the designs that we're currently working on so that they're part of the process of working on it so that they understand why we're making certain decisions. Because some may seem arbitrary. Like, I don't know, they put the button over here. Why did they do that? You know, they're talking in Stockholm someplace. I don't know, you know, Kevin did it. Which sometimes is a good enough answer <laughs> just to have them code it that way. But sometimes they'll question, so I need to know why. Okay, great. Yeah. I, I know there will be millions of other questions, but we should round up. Yeah, and please. I'm sure you're still here for a while to answer all the yeah. questions with a beer. Yeah. Um, you get from us our very um, precious batch Aww. as a speaker. Thank and you. I forgot to give it to the other two, so you can also come and I'll give it to you. <laughs> um, nice. Thanks a lot. Um, Thank you. It took, it took a lot to invite me, not knowing who I was or what I did or what oh, I was going to talk about. You see, sometimes, uh, even without user research, you're like... <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, our next event, I already mentioned it, it will be in Brussels in two weeks' time. And after that, four weeks' time, that's the 30th, 27th, the 27th, we are back in Antwerp at I.O., yeah. so not that far from here. Um, Hope to see you all there, and for now, just uh, enjoy a beer, a wine, a water, whatever you like to, and thanks for coming. Thanks.